The video effects in the Generate category are fun to work with. So let's take a look at them by going to Working Files, Projects, and going down to 1004 Generate Effects. Let's take a look at those effects by scrolling over here to Effects, click on that tab, open up Video Effects, and then go on down and open up the Generate folder there. And take a quick look at the names anyways. The generate effects generally appear to destroy whatever you put them on. I'm going to drag the four color gradient down to this clip here and let's see what happens. Boom. Now, is that what you want to have happened? Do you want to take that lovely clip and turn it into four colors? Probably not. You probably want to somehow have these things work together, have the four color gradient work with the clip that it's on. And in previous versions of Premiere Pro, you could do that without too much trouble. You could click on this, go to the Effect Controls panel, and look at the four color gradient, and scroll down here. And you'd see that it has a couple of things that let this thing blend in with this underlying clip. It has an opacity level, so you can adjust the opacity of that thing. But look, it just turns it black. It makes the whole darn clip black, so that's not good. So what do you need to do? Well, you need to turn on a blending mode. Something like Multiply, for example. Multiply kind of blends the two together in kind of a hard-looking way. And now the opacity makes a difference. But you have to have a blending mode to make it make a difference like that. So that's how you used to do things prior to CS6. And, you know, that works reasonably well. But you can have more control if you apply this effect to an adjustment layer. Let me turn this guy off and I'll explain that just a second here. Get rid of the four-color gradient on this clip. We're going to work with an adjustment layer. Adjustment layers are new to Premiere Pro CS6. They came over from After Effects, and they're really helpful. An adjustment layer lets you apply effects to it that then become visible on any effect that's below them that's visible. So here we have this adjustment layer above Scenic. Scenic has no effects on it other than the fixed effects. Here's the adjustment layer with tons of effects on it. I'll turn on the four color gradient. Now there it is above Scenic here. It covers it up as you'd expect, but now it's on a separate layer. So you can take that layer, put it in motion, for example, you can then shrink it down and you can affect just part of the clip below it, for example. Or you can open up the opacity property and use a blending mode here, for example, like multiply, like we did before. So it gives you more control in that you can change the size of it and use a blending mode here built into the, one of the fixed effects. I'm going to go back to normal here. And you still have the blending mode available inside the four color gradient, but you do have more control now in terms of how you can work with it. So I can put the blending mode on there as well. So we're going to work on adjustment layers throughout this lesson. The way you can add an adjustment layer to your project is you can go to the project panel like so, click on the new item icon and go adjustment layer, or go file new adjustment layer. And then once you add an adjustment layer, you'll see it here in the project panel, and you can put it anywhere. You can have any number of instances of that adjustment layer. You can apply it anywhere you want, any length you want, and that's how that works. We'll talk about adjustment layers in more detail later, but I just want to show you that's what's going on here. So I'm going to click on that guy reset the motion so it's back to normal. And I'll restart four color gradient by resetting that as well. So let's get started. Let's just take a quick look back at the effects. We're gonna look at these guys here, but we're gonna skip a couple. We're gonna skip lens flare and lightning because they both require a little bit of extra explanation. I'm gonna give you a really cool tip on how to work with lens flare to have it change color, which you can't do if you apply it to adjustment layer or to the clip itself. And lightning is such a huge effect that I want to explain it in more detail. And finally, I'm going to include a third effect in that lesson on lighting. So lighting, lightning, and lens flare. I'm going to include all three of them in one lesson because they warrant extra explanation. So let's go on up to the top here. We're going to start working alphabetically. We'll start with the four color gradient. We've got it applied to the adjustment layer already. I'll turn it on just like that, and we'll open it up and see the various properties. Look at the positions and colors. If you click on it, you know you're going to get a control point or two or three or four. And there they are. The control points say, what's the center of each color? You can move that around like so. There you go. Like that. And again, if you want to make this a little bit smaller, you could click on motion and pull it down like that if you wanted to. And you could put it down the screen in the corner or do other things that you can move it around. But I'll just undo that. Now, you can change the colors. You can keyframe the colors. You can have them move around. That's what's really cool about this. You can have the colors go all over the place. And on top of that, you can blend it any way you want. Blending modes. That's how the colors blend together, that is. You can make it jittery, meaning the borders are a little rougher around the edges, change the opacity, change the blending mode, all kinds of things you can do with a four-color gradient. It's just a lot of fun to play with. All right, let's move on down to the cell pattern. And unlike the four-color gradient and a lot of other effects here, you don't have an option to use a blending mode here. So I'm going to click on that one. And that's what would have happened had we applied it to the clip down here. And if you open it up, 
There'll be no blending mode here, just the various kinds of cells and things like that. And there are tons of different kinds of cells here, but the options here are just mind blowing. Invert, regular, and you can just change the size. You can move it across the screen using the offset. So if you click on this, you get that little control point again. This is the control point. It's an offset that lets you slide it around the screen like so. Also has something called evolution. Evolution lets you then set some properties and then evolve them over time. And so this really is a way that you can get it to animate. This is a really easy way to animate using evolution. So that's a great way to not have to worry about doing keyframes for these guys up here. And then if you now want to see the clip below it, this is where the adjustment layer comes into play. You use the blending mode in the adjustment layer, go over here to blending mode, and then pick a blending mode here, like multiply, and then you can see it through like that. You can also adjust the opacity here if you want to knock it down a little bit. All right, let's turn that off and go on down to the next one. Checkerboard. I'm sure you can guess what this one's going to look like. Let me adjust the blending mode back to normal here and bring the opacity back to 100%. I'm going on the checkerboard. There you go. There's the checkerboard. Very tiny checkerboard pieces there, but that's the default startup point. You can change the size, obviously. Do you want to make it larger, smaller, make these guys bigger? And again, you can use the blending mode. Let's scroll down here. There's a blending mode built in this time, so you could use a blending mode like Add. That makes the black areas go away. And you can change the color of the checkerboard, of course. You're not stuck just with the white. So now when you use Add, it has this little glow to it. So all kinds of ways to work with the checkerboard. We'll move on down the line here. Go on to Circle. Circle does what you think it does. Boom, it makes a circle. And you're kind of going, well, gee, is that really all there is? But you can actually make it transparent. There are a number of ways to make it transparent. Let's have a blending mode here of Add, for example. That's kind of backwards from what you might want to expect there. So you can invert the circle. And now you have this little hole there with a white background around it. Or let's try Multiply. Now if I make the circle black, let's see what that one's going to look like. There you go. Now you can make Multiply. If you invert it, you get the whole background. If you just make it regular, you got that guy there. And so now if you take the center of the circle, I'll click on the circle name here to turn on that little control point. There it is. You can kind of move it around and do one of those little reveals that you've seen before where People change the scene and they just go like this. They kind of go, look at here we are. Okay, so you can keyframe the radius, for example. So circle has some great potential like that. We're going to a new scene or we're done with the scene now, which is similar to the iris video transition, but you have more control here with circle. Turn that off. Well, here's ellipse down here. Well, gee, if you got circle, what's the difference? Well, ellipse is different because it creates this ring basically, as opposed to a hole. So you look at the ring, you make the ring larger, taller like that. You can adjust the size of the ring. Let's go on down here. How thick is it? It's it kind of strange you can do that though. And how soft the edges are, inside color, outside color. So you can make an ellipse and you can put it on top of the back layer or not. Your choice. All right, let's take a look at more effects. Eyedropper fill is an effect that I've never quite been able to wrap my brain around. All it does, from what I can tell, is that it just picks up a color from somewhere inside the clip and then creates this solid layer over the top of it. So you click on this guy for the control point, and wherever you drag this, it's picking up the color from whatever's underneath it, like the blue sky or the reddish brown rocks there. Not that you can see it though. If you want to see what you're doing as you're doing that, you can then blend with the original like so. Now you can see where you're dragging this thing around. But it's creating essentially a solid color layer on top. And then again, you can use the blending mode to blend it in if you want to do that. But for me, it doesn't really do much for me. I'm just going to take a pass and I drop a filter. There are other ways to do something like this. You can create a solid clip and put it on top anyway. So this is just a quick way to get a color from the clip. I think that's probably the best use for it. Going on the grid. Grid gives you a grid pattern, not the same as a checkerboard pattern. And you have two control points here. Let's grab this one here and move it around. This one, similarly. Spread it out a bit. Let's you control the size of the grid. Scrolling down a bit here. Make it bigger. Change the color. Like so. Change the blending modes down here. There's add again so you can see it through like that. And by the way, if you apply the grid to this adjustment layer, you might want to tilt it. So I'm going to change the color back to black because I want to show you what happens if you apply another effect to this and try to move it around. I'm going to switch over from overlay to, let's say, multiply to get the little black grid showing up nicely like that. Let's say I want to tilt that grid back, make it kind of a base here. 
So to tilt it back, I might apply something like the corner pin to it. So I'm going to go over here and look for corner pin and apply corner pin to the adjustment layer. I think since the adjustment layer is separate from this guy below it, I can then just tilt it back. So I'm going to scroll on down here to click on this little name here so I can turn on those four points. There they are. I'm going to drag it in, but look what happens. It moves everything because any effect you apply to the adjustment layer is as if you applied it to the one below it. So that's what happens with the adjustment layer. It looks like you've applied the corner pin to the clip below it, which you don't really want to do in this case. So let me just undo that. And I'll show you a way to work around this, and that is to work with a solid layer. Now, in After Effects, they have a thing called solid layers. They don't have that here inside Premiere Pro. I'm going to go over to the project panel, and I go down to this new item icon and click on that. And then there's no solid layer here per se, but there's something called a color mat, which will work as if this were a solid layer if you happen to work inside After Effects. So I'm going to click on that, make a new solid layer. You need to make it black, because we're going to apply effects here where we might want to make the black go away. So I click on that and say OK. And I'm going to call it the Black Solid, like so. Adds it to the project panel. I'm going to drag that on top of our existing set of clips here and drag it out so it's as long as the other ones. This is kind of a higher level trick that I'm going to explain when I work with the lens flare effect. But I'm just going to throw it at you right now so you can see how it works. I'm going to apply the grid to that one. So I'll go back to the effects, like so. We'll go apply corner pin to it now to get that over with. Then I'm going to go apply the grid to it. So I'll go back to the generate effects. There we are. And here's grid down there. And I'm going to apply that to it as well. So the black solid. I'm going to turn off the adjustment layer so you don't see that kind of messing things up behind it. So I'll turn off the visibility of this little eyeball here. It turns off the visibility of that entire track. Now we just see the black solid in the clip below it. So I'm going to set this up similarly to how we had it before. I'm going to thicken up the lines a bit there and turn them black. And now that things are ready, I want to tilt this, so I'm going to go to the corner pin effect, turn it on so I can see those four corner targets. Now if I take this and move it around, it looks like nothing's happening. The reason for that is because it's out of order. It's in the wrong place here. You need to have it happen after you apply the grid. So I'm going to take the corner pin and move it below the grid now, like so. There we go. But now when I move this, it's going to work because we applied the grid first and now corner pin after, so we can move the grid around like so. So I want to put the grid down below here. So want me to do that if I want to have it go off in the distance like that, have it have some perspective, whatever. Drag it over here, make it even wider, make it look like it's going off screen. And after you do this, you can, of course, change the size of the grid, the color, whatever you want. So if you want to have it go off in the distance like that or move around with it or do any other kind of contortions to it, it's best to put it on a black solid. That way you avoid affecting everything below it when you work with the adjustment layer. Already, that was a little sidetrack, but I wanted to give you a view of how that works. I'll drag that out of the way. And we'll go back and turn on the adjustment layer's visibility again. There we go. And we'll move on down the line. Click on adjustment layer to bring that back in the effect controls panel. And we'll turn off grid and move on down to paint bucket. And you're going to be kind of appalled at this one. It's like, whoa, why would I want to do that? Well, the way paint bucket works is that you have this little control point again. There it is. And wherever the control point is, it's replacing that color that's there with the color that you've got down here. And red is the default color, which of course you can change. So as I move this around in the blue sky, you know, it tries to select the blue sky. It does so by looking for edges. And it's doing a pretty good job of selecting the sky. I can say, let's expand that a little bit. Let's have it be more tolerant, as they say, to expand the view and make it all the blue sky as much as possible there. And now I've selected the blue sky, basically, like that. Now, of course, do we really want to have that big red blob of stuff? Well, probably not. We can have a blending mode now. Do something like multiply. So we have now red sky at night, or red sky in the morning, sailor's morning, whatever you want to say. Put on the soft light, where you can kind of soften it like that. Pretty nice. You can change the opacity on it. And if you decide that it's not really the sky you want to illuminate, if you want to illuminate everything else, you can select the sky, but then go invert. Now it'll affect everything else. Pretty wild, huh? It doesn't have to be red, of course, but red kind of works here. But let's pick a different color just so you can see it. I always love going to purple because it's so obvious. Ooh, look at that. There we go. Instead of soft light, make it multiply again so it gets dark. So that's paint bucket. The little control point here says, where are you selecting the color that you want to replace? So it'll be the blue color there. If I go down to here, it'll be the red color. All right, we'll turn off paint bucket and move on down the line to ramp. Ramp creates a gradient. That's as simple as that. Click on that, boom, turns into a gradient. Open it up, and you'll take a look at that gradient. See what the start color is, the end color. Right now, obviously, it's black and white. Let's change it to something you can tell. So 
sort of the old standby purple, and we'll go down to, instead of white, we'll go to something like yellow. So you can't miss it now. And we can change where those guys are located. You click on this, you get those control points again. There they are. This says where it begins up there, or where it starts dividing off, like so. Extend the length of the green or extend the length of the purple. You can also make it an angle, like this. You can have the default linear ramp or a radial ramp, like that. With the radial around, like so. Change the size of it. And then the blending here is blending with the original, how much the original you want to show through. But this is not really a good blending mode. It's no blending mode here. As I mentioned, some of these guys don't have blending modes, which again is the advantage of the adjustment layer. We go up here to the adjustment layer, change its blending mode, and let's say multiply again. And you can see how you can make those colors blend in really nicely with that radial and move it around if you want to highlight an area, something like that. That's how you can highlight it. Turn that one off and go finally on down to right on. And right on is an effect I recommend you don't use. It is insanely processor intensive. I'm not really clear why it is so processor intensive, but it is. It will basically shut down your system while you work on it. I applied it to this clip over here, and I had it follow this letter. I'm going to turn it off so it doesn't clog up the system now, but I wanted it to follow the letter. And you can use right on to reveal something. So I could reveal this letter using right on. Or you can take right on here and just draw on the surface and draw letters on the surface. But to do that requires using many, many keyframes. You draw a little bit here, another keyframe, a little bit here, another keyframe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It takes a lot of keyframes. And each one takes forever to do because you have to wait for the system to catch up to you as you apply the keyframes. So it's one of those things that, boy, if you've got the time and you're willing to do it, it can be pretty effective in terms of, let's say, revealing something. So over here in this clip, if you open this up, I'm not going to turn it on, but you open it up, it says you can then scroll down here a little bit and you can reveal the original image. So whatever you draw here, you draw thicker than the original letter, for example, and then you can have it reveal the letter like script as if you were writing that on the screen, which is kind of cool. But if you do it with right on, it takes forever. So I'm going to bring something in just as a demonstration here real quick. It's not a file that's going to be inside your assets, but I'm going to go there and get it anyways. It's one I've stored here temporarily and then I'm going to get rid of it just because it's taking up space that I don't need to take up. Let me go get it for you, and we'll bring it on in. There we go. And there's that little file, and I'm going to just open it up in the source monitor by double-clicking on it. There you go. And what I did was I applied right onto the beginning of this clip, made a four-second clip. It took me 15 minutes to render that four seconds, and it took longer than that to just to make the darn thing happen. So let's just take a quick look at it here. There you go. That was kind of a little bit of a clumsy start there, but that's how that works. It does animate on as if you were drawing the letter with that lovely script, but this is just a regular font that I got inside the titler. So let's just kind of watch that again. We'll go back to about there. There you go. And you can reveal it like this and it'll come on like so. So that's how right on works, but boy, oh boy, it can really be a pain in the system. So with that last little kind of negative side note, I really recommend the generate effects. They are just tons of fun to play with. They give you all kinds of possibilities in terms of how you can make your clips look different and more exciting. And again, I'm going to go over the lens flare, lightning, and the lighting effects in a separate lesson.